listen, this man has held six different belts. The only team to win all three major belts, the Crockett Cup. This man's a legend in How am I not going to like this guy, right? He knows everything. Now, I want to ask you one question. Welcome to another edition of Hero Television. I'm your host, P.L. Myers, along with John G. And our guest this month, the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend of television, radio, movies, you name it, the king of the misfit toys, the one, the only, Elliot Serrano. That is probably the greatest introduction that these folks are ever going to see about someone they've never heard of before. Wait a second. <laughs> We've all heard of you. Wait a second. You guys have heard of me. If you're from Chicago and you're, if you're a total nerd on social media like I am, um, or you listen to local radio here in Chicago, yes. Uh, but it's my understanding that, you know, this goes out to everybody outside. So I want to thank you guys for the opportunity of letting people outside of the Chicagoland area get to know me a bit and sort of the nerdy stuff that I do. Well, the great thing about this show, Hero Television, we've been on the air for 20 years when it was Continental Cablevision, the Media One, to Comcast, all these channels, and now our AT&T also was is that now this show with myself and John G, we're going to be on every Comcast in the whole suburb. So when you're watching this once a month, this is the place to be. Because, I mean, we've interviewed huge celebrities, and now we're keeping the, the train going, and we're interviewing you because for the people that know you, how do you get your start in, you know, this field? Because I'm probably when you're growing up, you said, I want to be a cowboy or I want to be Luke Skywalker. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Okay, first off... Um, what I'm generally known for is being part of what's called um, uh, geek culture or geek journalism. At least that's how I really got my start because, um, I mean, I grew up like a lot of folks, you know, like you, you know, all of us here, we all grew up with a really intense passion for a particular um, type of entertainment. I know for you guys, you know, it was uh, pro wrestling. That's how you and I got yeah. to know each other. Uh, for me, it was always comic books. And I mean, really, it, to me, the, the duo there was comic books and Star Wars. And those two are almost um, inextricably intertwined with each other because, um, you know, there are so many, you, you know, you're going to talk to a whole lot of folks who are going to say that uh, their love of Star Wars or Star Trek inspired their passion to get into science or writing or reading and stuff like that. And for me, um, as a young child, um, it was comic books and Star Wars helped me as a first generation Puerto Rican who didn't know any English when uh, my parents, you know, came here from the States. And, you know, I was born here, grew up in a Spanish speaking household. Um, my dad bought me comic books to get me to read English and to learn English. I watched a lot of Saturday morning cartoons. Mm -hmm. I watched a lot of, uh, um, I really wanted to learn to speak proper English. So I would, um, watch the nine o'clock news or the 10 o'clock news, mm -hmm. you know, with, um, on ABC with, uh, you know, John Drury and yeah. Fahey Flynn. I don't know if anyone, you know, I'm really dating myself there, but I was a little, little one. And, um... And it was just all that, all this about media and geek culture really helped shape the, the person I am today. So I really kind of wear it as a badge of honor that even though, you know, um, I'm kind of like a very Chicago specific type of, you know, personality, Chicago media really has made me who I am today. Well, that's the big thing. We, you know, John's done a lot with the media. I've done a lot with the media. And, you know, you, you the media has changed. When we were all growing up, there was one cable box with probably 30 channels, and you flipped it. I mean, before, you had to actually turn it back. There's a the, big knob on it. Yeah. On <laughs> TV? I mean, how many how many folks remember on TV? Uh, TV. And with the uh, tinfoil on the uh, antenna. On the antenna, you know. And remember the split screens? Oh, yeah. You know, and if you wanted to see something naughty, you just stared at the split screen long enough and you'd see it but yeah you know. and, and those are the great <laughs> things about the media that you actually see but back in the day but when you were growing up who were your heroes wow you know it's a great question because again there was a lot about me that you know I look back on who influenced me um and and my sense of what I what I like what I wanted you know the type of media that I wanted to to consume the type of media I wanted to get into so um, one of my earliest influences, and again, way dating myself right now and, and going way back, was uh, Bill Jackson. Mm -hmm. 
if anybody remembers Bill Jackson, he had a, a uh, cartoon show where he, uh, BJ and Dirty Dragon. Oh, yeah. Remember BJ and Dirty uh-huh. Dragon? Giggle Snort Hotel. G- and Giggle Snort Hotel, yeah. And he um, would host, you know, the, the show. There would be puppets. Um, B- uh, Dirty Dragon was um, a really sort of... Um, ill-mannered, ill-tempered dragon that, that he hung out with. And um, even uh, Bill had this uh, bowler hat mm-hmm. that he would wear as he put his hat up, uh, his feet up on the desk. <clears throat> and I remember, you know, just watching that. And the thing that got me about um, watching the show is that, you know, a lot of locally produced television, especially, you know, for uh, that was made for kids, was, you know, on a set, kind of cheaply produced. Um, so you really had to make do with what you had. Bill Jackson had this great personality that you really wanted to like, you know, when you were a kid, you wanted to hang out with him. You wanted to hear him tell stories, especially when he would sit there and he would um, draw, he would like tell a story and draw it as he was going. Um, You know, he'd he'd say, this is like the day, what character are we talking about today? And he'd do the bit where he'd draw a particular character and you wouldn't tell until the very end when he put those last final flourishes on there. Oh, this is the character he's been talking about the whole time. So both his sense of wanting to talk, engage, and drawing, that's my earliest influence as far as what I do, or why I do what I do now. After that, of course, um, Ray Rayner was a huge um, influence on me, too. Um, you know, Ray Rayner is like one of the reasons also why I liked, uh, I got so into Star Wars, too, because mm-hmm. he would do the bits where um, he would uh, show the clips to Empire Strikes Back during the show. And I remember getting up early in the morning so I could see those Empire Strikes Back clips. And this is back before, mind you, this is before you had things like YouTube, uh-huh. where if you wanted to see a trailer, right, a teaser trailer for something, they just they just threw it on the, on the channel. You could watch it whenever you wanted to. Nope. You just get up if you want to see it. Sit in front of the TV. Remember before VCRs? Oh my God, I am so old. (laughs) (laughs) Before VCRs, even before you could afford a VCR, right? And they were this big. They were huge. This huge chunky uh, beta, 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 beta beta is better. So George Lucas said, and well, we saw how that went. So those are uh, when I point to who influenced me the most. Who were some of my heroes? There and then, then when you go, that's when it came to television and media. When it came, and oh, Rich Coes, of course, uh-huh. too, who I am so like, I, I am so fortunate right now to be able to call Rich a friend. Yeah. You know, folks who don't know him as Rich, you might know him better as Svenguli, yeah. you know, the Svenguli show, and I'm um, go, he's nationwide on uh, Me TV. Um, so you have those guys, and then you know, then of course, I had. Uh, Stan Lee, yeah. you know, the creator of Spider-Man yeah. and the Hulk and the X-Men and um, other comic book writers who really informed my um, kind of like my sense of right and wrong when it came to what kind of heroes I idolized. So you you just talked about Bill Jackson, Ray Rainer, and those guys. Um, I know you worked with Rich Coe's a little bit. I, I, you know, it's funny. I can say I've done shtick with with Rich Coe's. It's so cool to oh, be able so to do that. So how was it? Ah, with... oh, man. Okay, here's the thing about Rich. First, Rich is one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet. Mm-hmm. And he's effortlessly funny. He's like, it. it, it it's kind of like, I like to think I'm kind of a funny guy. Um, I uh, People say I'm funny. I write, you know, humorous content for a living. Um, I've done that. I've written jokes. I've done stuff. I, I dabbled in uh, stand-up comedy, you know, years and years ago. Um, I even took classes at Second City to help me deal with improv and being in a room full of really smart folks so I can stand my feet and engage and make sure I'm part of the conversation. Rich hasn't done any of it. <laughs> and, and, and every time I'm with him, I'm like, oh my God, it's keeping up with him, you know, as far as being fun. And for him, it's just easy. Boom, boom, boom. It just comes right out of him. So whenever we would do our bits together, like um, we would host, um, we would both MC a fundraiser for the Lincoln Park Zoo's AZAC, um, American Association of Zookeepers, their Bowling for Rhinos event. And we would co MC. And there will be times when we're just going back and forth. And I'm riffing on him, he's riffing on me. And it's a lot of fun, you know, and it's especially a lot of fun when you can do it with someone who you've idolized for so long. You're going, oh, my God, I'm actually 
riffing with Rich Coe's here. This is a dude who's done so much stuff. And, you know, the dude's a freaking legend, you know, in Chicago. So being able to work with him and then, and, and to me, the greatest thing in the world is making him laugh. If I can make him laugh, I'm like, oh, boom, cloud nine right there. Because that means I've actually, you know, making people who are really funny laugh, that's harder than you think. It's, well, it's also trying to find out what their what their like is. No, no, you're on the other side of the the pop culture thing. Aside from you liking these guys, now there's a generation that feels the same way about you. Oh my God, really? Well, I do. I do. Oh no. So Jeez, I, you I mean, guys how, are how's so it feel? How's it feel? Being <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we need better heroes. <laughs> As a Tina Turner song goes, we don't need another hero because this is what we've got. Stop. Well, we'll, okay. we'll take what we can get. Yeah, oh, damn. Well, well, there you go. Uh, That's what it? she said. No. <laughs> we need a rim shot. Rip three. Uh, how is it being on the other side of it, though? You I, know, I see you at Comic Con. People come up to you. You know, I've, I've, it's funny that you say that. And I don't. Okay. Here, this is a thing. I don't want to say it makes me uncomfortable, although on a, on a, cer on a certain level, it does. But I do have to accept it. I have to accept that, yes, I'm at a point where, yeah, I'm not like the, I'm not like a quote unquote average fan. I'm, I've been elevated a bit. And because of the things that I've done, the platforms I've been on, the fact that I kind of have a louder voice than others, it, it kind of falls on me to understand that that's the role I have right now, even though, you know, I might not entirely feel comfortable with it. Which means that, one, you know, I'm flattered. I always say, folks, though, if I'm your hero, you really can find a better hero. You, you can be a, be, be a hero for yourself, is all I can say. And second, um, there are times that I need people to keep me honest on that. Because I've actually gotten myself in trouble um, in social media, um, at certain panels, where I kind of, like, forgot that... I am sort of like here. So as the old, with great power comes great responsibility. And I wasn't entirely responsible with that power I was given. So I've done things like offended, you know, Comic Con guests, making jokes that they didn't think were funny. But I made the joke because I thought it was funny. And I thought, come on, we're all here to have fun. But I, it's not about me. It's never, it shouldn't be about me. Um, I've said things, on, I've made jokes on social media, things that you might even say like among a close um, personal group of friends, but it's not things that you really should say in public. Now, I mean, not nothing racist or anything like that, but you know, okay, I'll admit, there are times I make chauvinistic jokes, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I mean, I consider myself a feminist, so it's like, but that's a long thing. We're running out of time in this segment. I don't want to go into that. <laughs> um, so yes, how do I feel about it? I feel like I'm still learning to accept it. I'm, I'm learning to be better with it. I know that I'm representing myself and a whole bunch of other people too because that's kind of what the expectation is. And, and, I, and But here's the thing. I'm not so big that I am never going to have someone come to me and give me their opinion on something I've said or I've done and just disregard it and go, you know, you're, screw you. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm Elliot Serrano. I'm the king of the geeks. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm never going to feel that way, I hope. And if I ever do, I just hope somebody kicks me in the nards. We'll, we'll, we'll do our best with we'll that. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, going back to your the heroes you were talking about, what was it like when you met them? Because, I mean, I'm guessing you probably met a few of them. And what was that like? Because, you know, it's kind of thing that when you put that hero up on that yeah. pedestal and you actually get to meet them, they either let you down or they're that much cooler. Yeah, don't meet your heroes, kids. Just don't. <laughs> there are some cases. It's very rare. Uh -huh. Okay. It's been rare where I've met someone who I've really idolized and they've really, like, really let me down. Uh -huh. Um, because I think uh, the, 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 we, we're in this age right now where we really can get to know people, again, with social media and, and pretty much media being in all our lives 24-7 regardless. Um, you really get to know people as people. Yeah. So I haven't, I've never gotten to that point where I've really met someone and I'm like, damn, boy, they really let me yeah. down. Um, but th there are times when I've met folks, and yeah, it's been really cool. Like, again, meeting Stan Lee... Yeah at a C2E2, when um, the folks at Read Pop asked if I would be, this is so funny, this is the funniest story. 
they sent me an email going, we, we're, we have Stan Lee's panel, and we'd like to know if you'd be interested in hosting it. If not, do you know someone who would? And I'm there going, at what point did you think I wouldn't want to host this panel? To be at sure a stage with Stan Lee, right? Yeah. And then meeting him, that was like when you had your hero pretty much be what you would expect. Gracious, um, giving, um, really down to earth. I mean, Stan Lee's getting up in years. Yeah. I mean, and I'm telling you, every year I always worry for 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 Stan Lee there that um, you know, he's not gonna be making another convention circuit. But that one was great. Um what about Bill Jackson? Do you meet him? I have not met Bill Jackson because he lives in Florida now, but I have written to him. Okay. He has written back to me, uh -huh. and he even sent me a Dirty Dragon uh, uh, drawing, which wow. was like the coolest thing. I have that right there. Bruce Campbell, another big hero of mine, really cool guy. I've um, you know Folks would know him from Burn Notice mm -hmm. and the Evil Dead movies. And um, Scott Bakula. Mm -hmm who I was a huge fan of from Quantum Leap. Um, and when he was, um, I was, I met him doing the captain's panel, uh, the Star Trek captain's panel at Wizard World, where it was Scott Bakula, uh, Avery Brooks of Deep Space Nine, and uh, William freaking Shatner, which is like, that was a huge moment for me, getting to meet William Shatner. And the first time I meet him, mm -hmm. he's poking at me and giving me grief and thinking, this was pretty cool. And I thought that was going to be the greatest night of my life. And in fact, it was the darkest night of my life. And if you really want to know what happened we when, do. We when do. I met William Shatner, I, the only time I've ever spoken about it publicly yeah. at, or any record of it is on the Nerdalogs, uh -huh. um, on the Nerdalogs storytelling. So if you just... Google Elliot Serrano, Nerdalogs. There's a podcast where I tell the whole story and I reveal what happened that night. That's the only time I'll talk about it on air. Now, I'll tell you guys uh -huh. when this camera's okay. off. Okay. Okay. okay, all right. But if you folks out there want to know, you're just going to have to Google it. See, there you go. We'll be right back with more of Hero Television in a moment. I'm firefighter Brandon Santiago, and you're watching Hero TV. We're back on Hero Television, and it's our guest once again to talk to Elliot Serrano of so many different media outlets, that, you know, from television to internet to all these things that you do. But for the fans out there that come up to you, because we just talked about that in an earlier segment about people that look up to you, how do you, what advice do you give them, and how do you get your start? Because it's so different. It's not what you know, it's who you know, and then you go down this path, and then one door closes, one opens. What do you do? Because it's a hard, I hate to say it's a hard answer to give them. No, you're right. And it is, it is, a, ch it is a challenge. I mean, to me, there, it's, kind of, um, it's kind of weird and, and ironic in a way. Today, it is probably easier to break into, quote unquote, media because there is so much social media. Um, the blogosphere, as it was called when it first started, um, has become more than just a bunch of folks typing, you know, creating columns and throwing them up on the internet. Um, there is a lot of uh, punditry and opinions, and let's face it, it, a lot of folks are looking to blogs and the like for actual news, because there are some really good uh, news blogs out there as well. Um, but the thing is, it's that whole, you have all that signal out there getting your voice to kind of like cut through all that, the static. So that's a big challenge. Um, for me, I mean, I'll be really, I'll be honest, I was very, very fortunate. A lot of things broke the right way for me. When I first started uh, writing, um, I started a YouTube channel called Comic Culture Warrior, where it was just like a fun thing. I met um, a fellow by the name of Jose Melendez at my local comic shop, and I thought he was a real, um, uh, really great personality. And I said, dude, let's do a comic book show where we would just sit and talk about things. And um, I would meet him once a week at, the, at, at Dreamland Comics, and we would sit down and record these segments and just post to them every week. And um, over time, uh, we developed this really loyal following. And people were like, when's the next Comic Culture Warrior episode going to come up? And, oh, man, did you hear what they said about that issue and that issue? And um, we were like the dark side of Siskel and Ebert. You know, I was, I was the, the fat, you know, cheerful one who likes everything. And Jose was the skinny, snarky one who hated everything. So, And then over time, it kind of like 
one thing led to another. And then I started a blog for Comic Culture Warrior. And then I started writing for an, um, an online magazine called Comics Waiting Room doing, doing columns. And it just, one thing led to another. And you start building your, um, your cachet online. Now, that's really what I tell folks. If you want to get into media, if you want to become, you know, a voice in this whole thing is you just got to stay at it. You got to keep going. You got to keep working on your, on developing your voice and the channels that you use and try to be as consistent and persistent as you can. And then when the time comes where you get that shot, boom, go for it. Because in my shot came when I decided I wanted to write for the Chicago Red Eye and be their geek features columnist. And when I went in, I said, you know, you guys, you don't have anybody who writes about this kind of stuff. I want to be the guy who does it. They went back and they did a little Google search on me and they found all the columns I did for Comic Culture Warrior, all the stuff I did for um, um, uh, Comics Waiting Room and so on. And they went, okay, this guy, he's not just some guy who's walking in saying, give us this job, give me this job. He's put in his time. Um, so that's why it, it, whenever uh, journalism students go to me and they go, hey, what school did you go to to learn? I go, hey, I, hard knocks. Uh, hard <laughs> school of hard knocks. I learned from the streets, yo. You know, I learned my journalism from the streets. Keep it real. Keep the, kept it real. Uh, uh, and I will say, now speaking of that, but then the folks at the Tribune, and there are two folks who really got on me. I got to give them a shout out. Uh, Kurt Wagner and Scott Kleinberg, who's now in um, New York. Um, they really got on me about really being more of a journalist when it came to writing my stuff. So I really cut my teeth under some good folks. Hmm. You know, since, since you have done it all, radio, TV, comics. But I, I, I've done TV, but the extent of me being on TV is either appearing on Rich's show yeah. as the talking hand at the door, or which is fun, yeah. but harrowing, because you get to hear that that dialogue one time and you have to figure out all your little bits, you know, right then and there. And, um, and uh, either, or doing a segment, you know, that he's involved in. So I haven't, okay, I've done other TV, but nothing like, I'm still waiting for the folks at Chicago Fire to get back to me. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. put in a good word for you. Oh, that'd be awesome. But is there any one of the things that you do that you really enjoy the most? Um, I'll be honest, this kind of stuff. I love doing these, these these bits where I can like sit down and have conversations. Um, like just uh, yesterday, um, I went. Uh, I was asked to do uh, something, you know, kind of along these lines for uh, Northwestern University's um, uh, WNUR radio. And I drove down to the Evanston campus at uh, the crack of dawn. And and um, um, Jamie Lee, the chairman with Jamie host, she asked if I want to just come in and talk about Pee Wee Herman for a bit. And we talked about Pee Wee Herman for an hour, no breaks. Wow. We just kept going and going. And she goes, she goes. At some point, you know, I, I have all these music cues in case we run out of things to talk about. And I go, girl, I can jibber-jabber about anything. <laughs> so, but so this kind of stuff is fun because it gives me a chance to talk to other folks about their passions and, you know, and what they're into and kind of like offer my own perspective to it. It, it kind of refreshes me too to like get to engage with other folks and talk about things because otherwise it's either this or I'm just yelling at people on Facebook. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Everyone knows that. You mentioned Chicago, Chicago Fire. Is there anything aside from Chicago Fire that do you have kind of as a goal that you really want to do in the future? Well, I was joking about the Chicago Fire thing, but hey, I a... want to play a corpse, like on one of these shows where I'm just dead and they make me up and I lie there. I can hold my breath for a long time. But anyway, um, I've, I've always wanted to get killed in a horror movie. Uh -huh. I always wanted to be like the guy who just like gets killed or like eaten by a dinosaur, like in a Jurassic Park. Okay, I mean, right. but no, right now, and this is my, my thing, I mean, I really want to do more stuff in comic books. Um, I've written um, the Army of Darkness book for Dynamite Entertainment. They had that license. I've written Xena, Warrior Princess. I've, and I've written Grumpy Cat, which was a lot of fun. Um, right now, because when I was a kid, I really do look at Marvel comics, and specifically their Star Wars comics, as something that was instrumental in really in really inspiring my passion for reading and wanting to read because like I said my dad bought me comic books as a kid because he wanted me to read 
And I went from comic books to the you know books with no pictures in them, right? You know, prose novels. And then I, but after Star Wars, I read Starship Troopers by Robert Heinlein, and that was like that that book blew my mind, and and other things. But you know, again, I can go on and on. I can jibber jabber for a mm-hmm. while. To me, though, I would love to write a Star Wars comic. If I can just write one comic book, I have one. I got like a, I've got a Luke Skywalker story I would love to write. If I could just run, write one comic, book. hey Marvel, I don't want a long run on your book. I don't want a lim- I don't even need a limited series. I'll write one issue, an annual. Okay, I'll write a backup story. I don't mind. I don't care if I can write that one Star Wars comic. I'll check that off my bucket list, and then I can say I'm good. So many things, and this is this is why Elliot can talk. Of, he has so many different things on his plate, and all these ideas and thoughts. But for you, what keeps you motivated? Because you know, with going through radio, television, all the ups and all the downs, what keeps you motivated? You know, it's funny. Um, it, there's that old saying that if you need something. To motivate you to speak, then it's because you don't have anything to say. Mm-hmm. And I've always got stuff to say. So, you know, th- we are in interesting times right now where um, opinions kind of direct, the di- you know, the way things go. Mm-hmm. It used to be you could say things, just throw stuff up against the wall, and you had no real repercussion to uh-huh. it and that's not the way things are these days it's like but it and to me i've always believed words always have mattered so um there is no such thing as empty words so uh, what motivates me what motivates me is just this desire to to speak to have my voice be heard um and, but also the hope that my words can have a positive influence on people um i remember when i was a little kid I told myself, I will know I've accomplished my purpose in life when I have a page, an entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Hmm. Remember Encyclopedia Britannica? Now, Again, I'm old. Yeah. Um, but now there are no such things as encyclopedias. I even think Encyclopedia Britannica is like all online now. If I get a Wikipedia page, I think I'll be happy with that. We'll work on that. <laughs> well, all I can say is, Alec, for myself and, and John G., we're so glad you're on our show, Hero TV, because he is a true hero to so many of us that that follow him every day. So uh, if people want to follow you, what's the best way to follow you? Well, of course, you can follow me on social media. Um, I'm easy to find. If you remember... It's Elliot Serrano with two L's, two T's, and two R's. Uh, if you forget that one T, you might you might miss me. Um, and oh, I had another one we didn't get a chance to talk about, but actually, someone who's even more famous than I am. I will save that for next time. Next time, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, because because we gotta bring him back on. So you can have me back on. We'll talk about the part of my life and the person in my life who's actually more famous than me. Uh, this is actually the Kim Kardashian to my to my uh, Kanye West. Oh. Well, thank you again for watching another edition of Hero Television. We'll see you next month. This was going to be my greatest weekend ever. Uh Greatest weekend ever. What happens? Um, It's the night of the um, the, um, uh, captain's panel. And... um, I, you know, I thought this, I don't need to really, it's not like I really need to research this one so much because I know Star Trek. I know Shatner. I know Avery Brooks. I know Scott Bakula. It's not like I need to go in and do all these things, you know. I knew, like, the I had, you know, basic filmography stuff. And plus, they're not going to talk that much about out, stuff outside of Star Trek. Anyway, and I was just there to, like, make sure the Q&A didn't run too long. And it's weird because even before the... Um, the panel started, the um, Wizard World folks come to me and they go, okay, I want you to know, well, first, um, there's going to be some in the back. When there's 10 minutes left, they'll let you know. Five minutes left, you know, I know that. Also, um, we really like you to make sure that no one asks Avery Brooks any really personal questions. I'm like, personal questions? Yeah, I know, I'm going yeah. personal, uh-huh, whatever. Okay, because, you know, Star Trek, you know, fans in general, it can get kind of weird. Yeah, right. And it kind of made me think, it's like, remember that, that old SNL bit that yeah. Shatner did, the Get a Life bit? Yeah. yeah. You know, where people are asking him questions about stuff. And he's-